Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given, been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since then, we have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Can you hear me? Great. Um, yeah, my name is Stuart. I had my welcome to that of uh, Garrett's. It's great to have you with us, particularly if you're joining us for the first time. Um, as you will have noticed, we're in Romans chapter 5. Please keep that open in front of you so that you can at all times see that what I'm saying is hopefully coming from God's Word and not my own opinion. Um, Romans is where we are going to be camping, Romans chapter 5 to 7, uh, until the end of the term. If you were here last year, you'll remember that we did Romans chapter 1 to 4, um, and that that is really the bread and butter of the way that we teach here uh, at Christchurch Pinetown. Uh, we teach book by book, and we work from the beginning to the end of that book. And the reason is because we don't just believe that the content of the Bible is inspired. Uh, we believe that the form of the Bible is inspired as well. That is, the way God has arranged it for this passage to come after this passage and before this passage carries in itself meaning and purpose for how he's communicated to us. And so that's why we preach book by book mostly. Occasionally, we will do topical things here and there um, and so that's what we're going to be doing uh, for the, the rest of our term together. Um, so will you bow with me as we, as we pray? Um, Lord Jesus, uh, this really is the, the high point of our service and our time together. It is to sit before you as, as sons and daughters and to hear you speak to us. And so, Lord, we pray that uh, we would open our ears and we would open our eyes to hear and to see uh, what you want to reveal about yourself, about us, about our salvation, Lord, and how to live in this world uh, with hope and an eye for the next. And so, Lord, we just pray that you will really give us all that we need to, to listen well and, and to put what we hear uh, into practice in our lives, that we could leave here and be more joyful and confident and assured of all that we have in you. Amen. What is the story that you tell yourself about life? Uh, a follow-up question to that would be, what is therefore the story you tell yourself about yourself? Let me give you an example of what I mean. There, there are some people whose interpretation of life, possibly because of experiences they've gone through, maybe when they were especially young, is that the world is a dangerous place. There are people in it who are out to get you, and actually there's not a lot you can do about that. And therefore, if that's their sort of interpretation of, of life, then they say to themselves when things go wrong, I am once again the victim of this cruel world, this dangerous world, and no matter what I do, people seem to hurt me. 
The author, Michael Lewis, um, if you've ever watched the movie The Blind Side or if you've watched the movie Moneyball, uh, he is the author who wrote a book that basically inspired those movies. And he was once interviewed on a podcast and, and he made a, a point similar to the one that I'm making here. He said, as I got older, I could not help but notice the effect on people of the stories they told about themselves. If you listen to people, if you, if you just sit and listen, you'll find that there are patterns in the way that they talk about themselves. There's the kind of person who's always the victim in any story they tell, always on the receiving end of some injustice. There's the person who's always kind of a hero in any story that they tell. The smart person, while well, they deliver the clever put down. There are lots of versions of this. And you've got to be very careful about how you tell these stories because it starts to become you. You are, in the way that you craft your narrative, kind of crafting your character. And so, I did at some point decide I am going to adopt self-consciously as my narrative that I'm the happiest person anybody knows. And it's amazing how happy-inducing it is. Lewis is, is quite a profound quote, and Lewis, I think, is right about a few things. We do adopt certain storylines, and we do cast ourselves as a particular type of character as we go through life. He's also right to say uh, that the stories we tell ourselves are who we inevitably become. You know, neuroscientists have discovered that the same brain networks that help you to understand stories overlap with those which help you to interact with other people. And so, the person with the victim mentality believing that everyone is out to get them, well, guess what? Their constant fear and anxiety of others will keep them watching out for every hidden motive, every underhanded insult that might come their way. And the more that they are looking out for those things, the more they will end up finding those things, even when they're not there. So that with each perceived attack, it feeds into their belief that they are a victim. And so the cycle goes round enough times until you have become the very thing that you are narr narrating to yourself in your mind. Do you see? Now, it's because of knowing that you know, Lewis has observed that in the world, is knowing that, that he says at the end of the quote that he's chosen the story of happiness for himself and that it's working. I want to say, is it really that simple? You know, willing yourself to be happy, maybe that's something you can do in good times, but do you really think you can sustain that within yourself in the midst of suffering? What he's really proposing is, is what we call positive thinking. But positive thinking is, is actually a bit of a hack. Because it says, as he says, I know telling a positive story makes for a happier life, so that's what I'm going to tell myself. But what if God made us to work this way because he has a true and better story to tell us? A story that will change the way that we see life and ourselves for the better. A story that we will not just make up to achieve some measure of happiness, but one that is objectively true and therefore can become the foundation of real joy in our lives. And Paul would say, well, I'm glad you asked because that's why I wrote Romans 5, 1 to 11. Why don't you read it? So, I don't know if you noticed as it was read that uh, in this passage three times, Paul repeats, we rejoice. Verse 2, verse 3, and verse 11. We rejoice. 
that word is a, a combination of joy and of confidence. And it's something that only a Christian can do because it's not based on feelings. It's not based on circumstances. It's not based on positive thinking. It's based on living in a true and better story. So what is that, that life story for Christians? Well, look at verse one. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. See, every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Another way to, to put that is that every story has a past, a present, and a future. So Paul here gives us three things. If we trust in the Lord Jesus, and this is still all by way of introduction, should say this is a lengthy introduction, so don't worry, um, don't panic, but three things, past justification, present peace, and future hope. So past justification, look what he says in verse one. Since we've been justified by faith, let's stop there. Cast your mind back to the last term of last year, we were looking at Romans chapter one to four. Those words are basically a summary of what Paul was arguing for in Romans one to four. That's why we titled that series, The Way to Be Righteous. And Paul made it very clear, there is only one way to be righteous. It has nothing to do with how good you are. It has nothing to do with how much you've kept the law or whether you've been circumcised. It is really to be declared righteous in God's sight, like a judge who would stand up and say, you now are innocent. Even though we have lived unrighteous lives, and even though Paul says we deserve the terrifying wrath of God to be poured out on us, Romans chapter three, wonderful news, Christ has taken our sin and he's taken God's wrath onto himself at the cross. And so it's when we respond to that message by faith that God then comes to us and he gives us Jesus' righteousness. That is the first part of the Christian story. That is where it all begins and it changes everything else. Because in God's eyes, you will always be accepted and you will always be in the right with him, no matter what. And so it is this first piece of news in the chain which causes a reaction that shapes our present and our future life. And that's really what Paul's moving on to next, and it's, it's why we've called this series The Way to Live Under Righteousness. The Way to Live Under Righteousness. Because Paul's focus now is changing. It's turned away from the past justification that we can have in Christ to now look at what are the benefits of that for our present and our future. And so he gives us two right away. He says, it's because of justification that we now have, verse one, peace with God. Peace with God. I should say that that is, is not the peace that we get uh, inside of ourselves, um, like if maybe you go for a spa treatment or you practice mindfulness and you say, oh, I just, I just feel so at peace inside of me. That's, that's not what Paul's talking about here. The peace that he has in mind is, is that between two beings, between God and us. And so it is, is an objective peace, the way you might say that Ukraine and Russia, we hope, would come to find objective peace if they were to put down their weapons and come to terms. And so this is, this is not a feeling, this is a reality that God has put down his weapons with you. That there is no more wrath, there's no more hostility between you anymore. And so now verse two, that means that you have the privilege of access. Access into his presence. You, you can meet with him and know his grace. 
it means that no matter how bad we fall, we still stand because we are justified by his grace. As Christians, we may do things that grieve him, we may do things that displease him, but never ever again will his anger be kindled against us because we have peace with God right now if you trust in Jesus. It's also because of justification that we have future hope. Paul says in verse two that we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Really, that is, if you are into highlighting verses in your Bible, highlight that, because that, I think, is the key verse in the passage. And really, the rest of the passage from verse three to 11, it's, it's focusing now on that hope. It, it wants to pour concrete into that hope, as it were. Now, as soon as we, we talk about hope, we have to clarify things. We can't confuse the way we talk about hope today with Christian hope. Those are completely different things. So, so worldly hope, the way we use it today, is wanting something to happen in the future that we have no certainty of. So you, you hear people say, you know, I, I really hope that I will win the lotto one day. As we know, statistically, the chances of that are basically zero. Not quite, but we st people still play in the hope that one day they might win the lotto. Christian hope, of course, it's, it's not like that. It is to be certain of something that will happen in the future. See, one day we will see Christ face to face and we will share in the glory of his likeness. And so in that sense, if we believe that, we must say that every Christian has a bright future. We know the ending and it is very, very good. It is that shaft of light that we see at the end of the tunnel that helps us pull us through our present circumstances. That is what hope does. And so for the rest of our time, you'll see three things that pour concrete into our hope of glory, that help us to have confident joy no matter what comes our way. Three things, you ready? Here's the first. Here's the first. Suffering grows our hope. Suffering grows our hope. Famous words, verse three. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. So he's saying that there are reasons for suffering that are so wonderfully good that we can rejoice even though suffering can be so absolutely awful. That is the positive outlook that Christians can have in the midst of suffering. It means that each trial we face is an opportunity to grow our hope. Now I say opportunity there, that's a really important word, because suffering doesn't automatically grow our hope. There are some Christians who have suffered so terribly, more maybe than you and I will ever suffer, and yet they are also the most bitter and angry people you will ever meet. And that is because they wasted the good that the suffering God sent them that was meant to do in their lives. And so when we embrace the opportunity that suffering presents, when we do that with joy, Paul says it's gonna produce three things in us, three wonderful things. The first is endurance, endurance. That is to be able to bear up under the pressure of something, the strain of something, and to not give up. It is, is to patiently hold the line one day at a time. It is not to be knocked back in our faith with every small hardship that would come our way. 
And when we endure, he says that is going to produce character. Character, that is a quality that someone gets from having been tested. That's what that word means. Tested by trials and being approved, having passed the test. So I'm, I'm told that engineers are, are required to do stress tests to, to buildings so that they know how to build them in such a way that they are going to withstand the pressures uh, around them. And that is what trials do for the Christian who faiths them with joy. Because when you come out the other side of a trial, what has happened is that you've proved your mettle. You have now become more confident and mature as a person that is better able to endure the next challenge that you might face. It produces character. But that now in turn produces hope. How does it do that? Well, it turns all of our pains and our griefs into little reminders of all that heaven isn't. I'll say that again. It turns all of our pain and our griefs into little reminders of all that heaven isn't. Because it's not in the good times that we pray. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me, as painful as it is, that this is not my home. Come, Lord, come soon. We don't pray that prayer in good times. It is in bad times when our Christian hope comes into sharp focus again and we are driven into the arms of our only refuge and hope in times of trouble. It is when we are brought to tears that we remind ourselves that we are headed for a place where every tear will be wiped away. And so our suffering grows our hope in that coming day. It grows our hope. Second thing is that God, God's love anchors our hope. God's love anchors our hope. Verse five, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. In moments of suffering, it is very easy for us as children of God to wonder to ourselves, does God really love me? You know, perhaps he isn't there and, and the hope that I have is really just all in vain. You know, what if this is all just a nice story that I, I tell myself like Michael Lewis just to get through life? And what if, what if I'm gonna find at the end that there's actually nothing there? Well, perhaps we say, no, no God, God is there. I know he's there, but what if he's changed his mind about me? You know, maybe he's sending this pain into my life to punish me. Have I done something wrong? If you've ever found yourself thinking these things, then, then here is a beautiful truth that Paul wants to assure us with. God was so determined for you to know his love that he sent his Holy Spirit to reside in your heart. Paul describes that as God's love being poured out. And so you can imagine your heart as a, as a container. God, through his Holy Spirit, didn't just put a few drops in it. No, he's not stingy with his love. What he did was he poured it out again and again until it was overflowing. He did that on the day that the Spirit came to dwell in you when you became a Christian. And that love has stayed there ever since. It is the Spirit in us who makes that real to us. Uh, he, he brings it home to our sensations so that we can say that we've actually experienced the love of God. That's why it's something we may not be able to explain, but it is something that we know to be true deep inside of us. And that gives us the assurance we need for the future. 
But that's not the only way that God proves his love to us. Not just by sending his spirit, but first by sending his son, verse six. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, but perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, something hasn't just happened on the inside of us. No, a historical event has taken place outside of us. It is one that we can point back to and that we can see how once and for all God proved his love for us. I want to ask you a question as you sit there, who are you prepared to die for? If it came down to it, who would you take a bullet for? Paul says, you know, human love, it might be prepared to die for a good person. That is someone maybe who is in a close relationship with us and who really represents something good in our lives. It would be really hard to, to lose them. He says, on the very, very odd occasion, perhaps the greatest human love you could find would be willing to die for a righteous person. That is, you know, maybe not someone you'd know that well, but you respect them for the upright life that they live. Uh, to, to say you'd know that if they were to die, some good would be lost to society, even if that wouldn't benefit you directly, maybe someone will die for that person, but that is as far as human love goes. He says God's love goes further than that because Christ died in the place of, of the good? No. The righteous? No. What does he say? Four times he describes who Christ died for. Christ died in the place of the weak, the ungodly, sinners, enemies. God loved us at our most unlovable. When we opposed everything that God stood for, everything that was him and that he loved. And at the cross, while he was proving his love for us, we were proving our hatred for him. See, what happens when the God that you oppose takes on human flesh and he lives out right in front of you everything that you despise, the truth that you hate? What do you do? Well, you grab him and you put him on an instrument designed to torture and kill your enemies. So we can say as we look back that the high mark of humanity's hate was at the same time the high mark of God's infinite love. Here's Paul's point. If you take nothing else away from this, these verses, it's this. It is an indisputable fact of history that Jesus died on the cross for you. Therefore, it is an indisputable fact that God loves you. Since it's not possible to go back in time and make that event disappear, so it is not possible for God's love to disappear from you. That, when you get that, that is the anchor of our hope. It was proven 2,000 years ago. It comes to us and made it's made real to us today by the Holy Spirit living in us so that we can press on with joy for tomorrow. A former ministry colleague of mine, um, he once told a story when he was preaching on this passage, which, you know, it was so wonderful that I had to share it because I think it's, it's really helpful. During World War II, a, a Japanese lieutenant called Hiru Anoda um, was sent to a Philippine island 
And he was told, you know, he had a mission to do there and that under no circumstances must he surrender. A year later, the war ended, 1945. Uh, Japan had, in fact, surrendered to the Allies, and the Japanese army tried to, to track Onodo down. Eventually, they did, and they dropped leaflets over the island. They flew over it. They dropped leaflets telling Onoda that the war was over. You can surrender now. Come home. But still, Onoda and his men kept fighting and kept evading arrest. Every attempt to get him to put down his arms was seen as a trick from the enemy. Even after all his men had finally surrendered, still he kept going on his own. It was in 1974, 30 years later, that Anoda finally believed the news and surrendered. I tell that story for those here this morning who have not yet trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death. The war with God is over. He's declared peace by the death of his son on the cross. Can I say, what a tragedy it would be if like Anoda, you keep resisting that peace for you to hear the good news today and, and choose not to believe it, to refuse to surrender, to keep fighting for a cause that has no purpose and will not win. All that you have to do is surrender to him because the wonderful thing is that like any other, unlike any other victor, he has paid the price to make peace with you. So if you wanna do that, please chat to maybe the person who brought you, chat to myself, good enough. We'd love to help you with that. Because when you make that decision, when you trust the Lord Jesus, that's the moment the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you and he pours God's love into your heart. Third, final point then, is that reconciliation guarantees our hope. Reconciliation guarantees our hope. Verse nine. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Verse nine and 10, Paul just repeats the same argument he's making twice. And to put it very simply, uh, he's basically saying, since God has already done the very, very hard thing for you, of course he is going to do the relatively easy thing one day. What is the really hard thing? It tells us he's justified us by his blood. He's reconciled us by the death of his son. What is the relatively easy thing to happen one day? He's gonna save you from his judgment when he judges the world. His wrath will not fall on you. So I was thinking how to maybe explain this, illustrate this. Imagine that, um, that a young Zulu man meets a woman and things develop between them uh, to the point where he decides that he's now going to marry this woman. What does he do? Well, immediately he starts saving. Uh, overnight, his lifestyle changes. He's no longer spending money in lavish ways on himself. He's working hard at his job, and eventually months turn into a couple years of him saving and saving and saving. Eventually, he's now ready to enter negotiations with her family. So he goes out, he buys the expensive bottle of whiskey to get into the meeting before the real meeting. And then he, he meets the uncles and he convinces them that he has noble intentions. A few months go by, they meet again now for the real meeting. The Lobola price is negotiated, it's the hardest part. Eventually, it's decided. 
And with fear and trembling, he learns that he has to buy a few cows, he has to hand over a large sum of money, most of what he's really been saving for. Does that to one day, family say to him, okay, now you can marry our daughter. Now, if you are the, the lucky lady in this scenario, you're waiting now finally for this big day to arrive. Is it reasonable for you to be thinking, gee, I wonder if he's going to pitch up. I wonder if he really loves me. I would want to say, don't be dumb. Of course he's going to show up, okay? He's been showing up for the last three, four years of his life. They've been the hardest part of his life. He's done the hard part. Do you really think he's not going to be waiting for you at the end of the aisle with a big, lame smile on his face? No, he's waited in hope for this day. And so what hope we should have, you know, what confident joy. Soon you will see him face to face united at last with your whole lives ahead of you. And so friends, as we wrap up, I'm sure you can see that that is you and I. If we've been justified and reconciled by Christ's death, that is our life story. And it is a true story in which we are characters who are loved by the triune God. Every day, We are to wake up into that story and rejoice. Ours is the hope of glory, of seeing him one day face to face, where all of the glory that was lost in the Garden of Eden will be restored, and we will be like him in his splendor. In that moment, it will overturn all of the pain and the hardships, all of the dark nights of despair, the waves of, de- of grief that we have suffered here, for all of our financial stresses here, we will never search for bread there. For all of the political and social chaos that is happening around us now, we will know the stability of his perfect rule then. And so we should let not a single hope remain here in this earth, but rejoice that all of our hopes will there soon become real and that we would let that thought put strength into our weak knees to press on whatever we may be facing now because we know where we're going and we know whose arms we will be in. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that as Christians, we don't have to do things like positive thinking. We don't have to tell ourselves to be happy. We don't have to pretend that things are really good because you have made us a part of a true story in which it is only faith, trust, reasonableness on our part to have joy, to be confident as we look to the hope of the future, knowing that it is as sure as the past that we look back to, that Christ died for us on the cross. It is sure as the present that the Holy Spirit pours that love into our hearts, gives us the peace we know that we have with you, So I pray, Father, for any here who still reluctantly resisting your rule, who will not surrender, who will keep that hostility between you and who will ultimately lose, who will have to pay for that when you come again. Lord, we do not want that to happen. Please reconcile them, justify them too out of your great love. Help us now to close our time in worship.
of you with all of these truths swirling in our heads and carried into this week. For Jesus' sake, amen.